But today we talk with somebody who's maybe least known, but on the world scene is one of the greatest souls that ever existed in the 20th century. Um, again, I'm going to defer to uh, Dr. Seat later on uh, for him to correct me. Um, I, I need to learn some new things. I have learned a lot in preparing for this and had to, uh, I even found in the most definitive biography on Kagawa, found a bunch of mistakes. I couldn't believe it. Uh, and when you check it with the rest of the historical record. At any rate, Toyohiko Kagawa was born on July the 10th, 1888, and his birth in Kobe, Japan is really important. He's the son of Junichi Kagawa, who's a Buddhist and a member of the Japanese cabinet and secretary of the Privy Council, but also his mother is a geisha girl. It's, it's too complicated for me to explain what geishas are. They're not just prostitutes, but sometimes what you have in the history on Kagawa is that he's the product of an illegitimate um, birth and he's the, his mother was a prostitute. That's not the way it should be read, but that is how it's translated roughly into the Western culture. Uh, both of those parents die and he's brought up very briefly by his neglected wife, uh, his father's neglected wife, kind of his stepmom. Um, he will live with his uncle a little bit, then he enters a boys middle school, uh, meets two important persons, Harry Myers and Charles Logan. We have a picture of Charles Logan later on in the presentation, and he begins attending English Bible classes. He is really a great reader. He, will, he is really smart as a young kid. Um, he becomes a Christian at the age of 16. He's baptized by Dr. Myers. Uh, with some financial assistance, he moves to Tokyo to attend Presbyterian College. Um, he studies people like Immanuel Kant, a great continental philosopher, Charles Darwin, John Ruskin from the Isles, uh, Leo Tolstoy. Um, and he begins to have an appreciation of pacifism. Um, he will be inspired by Nagayo Ken, uh, who is an example of him about how to serve the poor. He will get, uh, a, uh, he'll get tuberculosis, have a miraculous recovery. On Christmas day in 1909, he moves into the slums of Kobe to serve people there. And he will live in a, a, a six foot square little paddock. And by the way, they said it would be no bigger than um, the prison cell that he'll eventually later be in. <laughs> and uh, in which in the prison cell, he walked two miles a day. Um, and he gave it himself the imaginative uh, description of, you know, I lived uh, in a uh, prison cell two miles wide, so. <laughs> He graduates from Kobe Theological Seminary. He's ordained as an evangelist. There's two ordinations, one in 1911 and another in 1918. But 11, it's Kobe. he's, he's uh, ordained as an evangelist. He will meet Haru Shiba. They fall in love. Um, they will eventually marry in uh, 13, a couple of years later. And she works alongside him in the slums. He goes to Princeton Seminary in 14, getting a BD degree, that's a master's of divinity degree in our current terminology uh, in 1916 and he returns to J uh, Japan. He's ordained as a minister, as a minister, not, this time not as an evangelist, as a minister in the Japanese Presbyterian Church. He begins organizing a lot. He organizes labor federation. He will do factory workers and farmers from 18 to 21 and ongoing by the way. He uh, will publish his very first novel 1920. This goes by various titles in English, Crossing the Death Line. Uh, it has a completely different um, translation later. It will sell millions of copies. By the way, he will publish in his lifetime somewhere between 150 and 300 books and or pamphlets that are circulated everywhere. Uh, in Japan, but only about 20, maybe 21 of them 
have currency in English. Luckily, because of something I never knew existed called the Log College Press, which we'll see later, is dedicated to, to publishing dead Presbyterian books. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's in their mission statement. The books of dead Presbyterians, mostly from the 18th and 19th century, but they've also published a lot of uh, Kagawa's books too. At any rate, this book will establish an income stream for him for the rest of his life and all of his other writings will too. Next slide. So um, he released from prison. He helps the Japanese government in terms of social welfare programs, establishing credit unions, schools, hospitals, and so forth. Um, and he has in mind the application of Christian principles to rectifying the injustices in society. Um, universal male suffrage for voting is granted in 25. He will eventually vote for universal suffrage in Japan after World War II. He founds the Anti-War League in Japan in 1928. In 1933 and in 36, he will come to the United States for several uh, uh, speaking tours uh, in a uh, for the living of these days, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick accounts, um, gives an account of when uh, Toyohiko Kagawa went to Riverside Church in New York and was opposed by people who accused him of being a socialist, a communist, uh, an imperialist, all at the same time, uh, who decried his presence and how Kagawa, with his wonderful, inimitable manner and uh, style, and spirit calmed them down and kind of won them over. Uh, that's on page 211, by the way, in, uh, as I recall, in uh, For the Living of These Days. These tours in the United States in 35 and 36 are hugely popular. We'll see a, a newspaper ad that captures one of those. On the 14th of January in 39, he goes to meet Gandhi in India. Um, in 1940, he does something that would be reprehensible, unthinkable for a Japanese. He's on a tour of Japan, I mean of China, and he apologizes for uh, Japanese aggression in that war. In 41, uh, he visits the United States in an attempt to avert war. There's some correspondence between him and FDR he is kind of quarantined because of a thing that he has. He has trachma, which is eye disease that he contracted in the slums of, of Japan. And when he comes in 41, he's quarantined because of that. And Roosevelt springs him from the quarantine and says, let this guy go, come on, he needs to go and do his thing. Um, and he will do the rest of his tour. In 41, from 41 to 45, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Kagawa does some things that now are viewed as fairly controversial and reprehensible to the West, to Westerners like you and me. He will decry the barbarism of the United States because he's a pacifist basically, but he's also loyal to Japan and he will kind of stick up for the uh, emperor. He will stick up for his Japanese brothers and sisters. He will be in and out of jail during World War II uh, a couple of times, however, because of his positions that were not in keeping with the militarists whom he basically opposes and did most of his life. But it is an after the war is over, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after um, Japan is occupied by MacArthur. There's some very interesting correspondence, by the way, and connection between MacArthur um, and Kagawa um, that you can read about in his biography or biographies about him. Uh, he will kind of go to the emperor who is now kind of denuded, if you will, of power, no longer has a spark of divinity in him, and Kagawa will appeal to him and say, Emperor, if you really want to be great, if you really want to tend toward, uh, 
lean into that godly character that people say that you have, then you will be a servant of the people and you will begin to put our country back together. Do it. And so he inspires him. He begins to do that. He will renounce his divine status. The emperor will take on that kind of servant role. Um, and then um, uh, kind of follow in the footsteps that, that Kagawa has set for him. In 1950, he tours the United States, again, giving speeches. Um, he likes to meet with all kinds of people. In uh, 54, he goes to the World Council of Churches gathering in Illinois. Uh, he publishes his last book, The Purpose of the Universe, now entitled uh, Cosmic Purpose, which is kind of physics and theology wrapped up in one. It is a very interesting read. Um, I, don't, I can't pre pretend to really comprehend the physics of it. And I'm not sure that he's doing physics proper that, for example, that he could go toe to toe with Einstein or Heisenberg. But he does have an understanding of how the universe is put together. And he wants to reconcile that with his understanding experience of God. He will die in 1960 in Tokyo. He's buried there in Tokyo. He's posthumously awarded uh, Japanese highest honor, the Order of the Sacred Treasure. His stature in world history can begin to make an imprint on us if we know the, the first paragraph there. He is repeatedly nominated for the Nobel Prize, twice for literature in 47 and 48, and then four times for the Nobel Peace Prize in 54, 55, 56, and then again in 1960, the year of his death. He's renowned as a social reformer, a poet, a preacher, and an un unwavering pacifist, um, but he regarded himself as an evangelist. He is compared to Gandhi and Schweitzer because of his unflashing, unflagging compassion and care for the poor. And sometimes he's called the Gandhi of Japan. Sometimes he's called the St. Francis of Japan. Here's what I think are his premier principles. Kagawa lives the principles and he would have us live the principles which Jesus exemplified in his life and ministry as a great uh, quote, to walk in prayer, continuously asking and receiving power of God and again, to transform this power into new actions of love. This was the religion of Jesus. One of the best summations, I think, of what the religion of Jesus is all about. Next slide. He would have us live out the practic practicable, meaning practical, practical, that can be practiced, precepts from the parable of the Good Samaritan. He has this lovely quote, there are theologians, preachers, and religious leaders who think that the essential thing about Christianity is to clothe Christ with forms and formulas. They conceive pulpit religion to be much more refined than movements for the actual realizations of brotherly love among men. The religion Jesus taught was diametrically opposed, the opposite of this. Next slide. Thirdly, he would have us live the Christian faith in all aspects of life, including economics. He constantly lives and would have us live a life of humility. And I'm wondering if you can remember back to the session that we had with Fred Craddock, if this echoes or harmonizes with what you heard there. Do your best. And after that, leave the matter entirely up to God. Sorry about that typo. I'll, I'll clean it up later, Brent. Um, he leaves us with his words and a challenge. He says, I read in a book that a man called Christ went about doing good. It is very disconcerting to me that I am easily satisfied with just going about. Do you hear the humility in him? Next. His is a practical theology. This is a scene from uh, Tokyo or Nakashima, I can't remember where it is, Yokohama, maybe Yokohama or Tokyo, but this is um, 
after the 1923 earthquake that was so devastating. He says, the God of Jesus is a God of action, not just pronouncing with your tongue, not just telling, but doing acts of love. And he was a very, very major, major um, leader in the reconstruction of Tokyo after this, um, after this earthquake. And then we, we have to have some poetry from him. I want to be ever a child, to feel an eternal friendship for the raindrops, the flowers, the insects, the snowflakes. I want to be keenly interested in everything with mind and muscle ever alert, forgetting my troubles in the next moment. The stars and the sea, the ponds and the trees, the birds and the animals are my comrades. Though my muscles may stiffen, though my skin may wrinkle, may I never find myself yawning at life. Do you remember another echo and of Mary Oliver when she says in one of her closing lines of one of her most famous poems, I don't want to end up having just visited this life. We have a very similar sentiment here with Kagawa, mystical in his poetry. And then he has a humble bequest, and this is a picture of his gravesite in Tokyo. Please do your best for world peace and the church in Japan. And these were Kagawa's last words uh, with something of a smile on his face, according to Shodun, his biographer. Please do your best with work for world peace and the church in Japan. This is uh, the interior of that memorial, which is in the scene in the bottom picture. And this is the uh, Naru City Toyohiko Kagawa Memorial Museum. And on the shelf there, those books, I think, are all individual volumes of his own hand. That's how many books he produced in uh, his lifetime. You may not have known him much, and we, one of the sad things is we don't have very many videos of him uh, <clears throat> going about and also doing good. But um, he um, is a great soul worthy of our attention. If you were to start anywhere, I would probably start with songs from the slums. If you're an academic type, I would start with this book, by the way, Cosmic Purpose, which was put out in 2014, a new translation. And this Thomas John Hastings is really an expert scholar on Kagawa. 